I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and the January 28th Cloud 2030 discussion picked up where we left off about CapEx versus OpEx and changing the innovation cycles that we see. And we, we really stayed on that theme all the way through, although we jumped into Edge, we jumped into serverless and, and how serverless actually extends that model. Uh, we jumped into buy decisions and investment. Um, this, this really continued to dig in on, on how this uh, innovation uh, change in the way we think about infrastructure and buying infrastructure. And it's a really hard problem. And so you'll, you'll hear a lot of back and forth and discussion that I think is valuable into understanding it more broadly. Um, we talk about edge quite a bit because we see edge as potential disruption for uh, the way cloud is operated and the way investments are made in cloud uh, because edge is going to require a lot more infrastructure to be purchased. Um, and so uh, we really got to the heart of some of these issues. Um, still have ways to go. So there's a chance to hear your voice. Uh, jo join us at the 2030.cloud every week. Thanks. Yeah, we're, we're watching, we're having some discussions and watching people around the Kubernetes community and um, there's a lot of desire to use Kubernetes in, um, sorry to jump right into it, hi, um, in a, it's there, I have approval to use it, uh, you know, pound every, every peg into, into, into all the square holes, right? Mm -hmm. which rich is like that's the story of it every every everywhere so yeah it's like it's fun it's yeah. funny what, like you know, i don't I, already have enough scar tissue <laughs> of, course, of course what i keep what i keyed on there was the was a phrase you just gl sort of glossed over which is and i think it's and i'm hearing it more and more which i think is going to be a big deal is i have approval to do this Right. We're, it's, uh, I think we're, there are a lot of people figuring out, okay, who really got control here and what can I do? That's the, it's, it's the classic, um, way that we, we enabled, uh, shadow it, right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and the pan and the pandemic and the pandemic sort of brought that on. We've seen that at Leno with the, with the, with sort of cloud spend on everybody went you know rightly so right everybody went all out and then 2021 we're starting to see people go i spent how much i did what maybe it's time maybe it's time we take maybe it's time we step back and see where we put all of this stuff and what we really need and where it's all going and why does why does joe have a credit card like that that's that he's able to just go buy all that stuff with <laughs> I got one answer. Take that credit card, come to me, and let me do it for you. No problem. I filled it up with all my Robin Hood winnings. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. That's right. Does anybody, out of curiosity, I should does anybody have Hood. a have a position? That did anybody did anybody jump on the the bandwagon? No, uh, I'm not stupid. I, yeah, there's, there's two issues here. One is governance of spend, and one is governance of. Uh, the technology that's being used and there's you're yeah told two totally different things both relevant right it's uh, you actually i mean that's a that's a really good way to look at it too um and then you go back to what rob was saying is okay so who do i go to for a, who, who needs to go to approval on that right for each It, this is, it's interesting because I think where we're where where this is going is actually going directly into the the, the thread I wanted to pick up from last week um, about opex capex and and the change to the innovation cycle. Um, let me let me let me tee that up and, and dive in because because I've been thinking about it all week and it's it it fascinates me. Um, Last week, the back half of the, the discussion, we, we got into a, a CapEx OpEx conversation. And my big takeaway from that was that we have fundamentally changed the rules by which we're, we're investing in innovation. And you can give me counterexamples all you want, but fundamentally what we're, when we're, when we're looking at, at 
big ideas in the future, we're assuming that you are going to have to build a whole bunch of infrastructure to, to do it. Or even if you wanted to, you wouldn't. It would be a bad idea, which is the, it's the mentality that's important. That what you would do is you would build, you're, you're innovating on something on the assumption on the assumption that it's going to be, it could be built on borrowed infrastructure, pay as you go, right? That, that you, you'll give up incremental revenue to grow the idea. Um, and that you're going to, you're going to proceed it in much more incremental steps. So I, I think like the whole way people, have, uh, and I know this from VC funding models, it's very true that, that when I look at innovation going forward, I don't assume that it's going to be, you know, uh, a big R and D cost followed by a big investment cost where I have to build a whole bunch of stuff and then capitalize on that idea over time. We're, we're looking, we're assuming that we can break things into small units and then move much faster through that model. That was my takeaway, takeaway from this. And that it's significant because now we have fundamentally rethought how, uh, how we're investing in innovation. Um, and, uh, and I'd love for somebody to say, no, that's not right, Rich. It looks like you want to- Question, yeah. it's yeah. more a question of clarification. You, you, you're using the term innovation as opposed to you know, development of a new product. Is that what, mm. what are, are you drawing a distinction that's specific to innovation? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm thinking of any, any new product. Any, so any, any new, what, what you would have in the past th thought of, I mean, I'll, I'll make it very specific to how, you know, I deal with things on a, on a, you know, what, what, where my business goes, which is, do you buy a server or not? Um, and, and it's funny because you don't have to buy servers anyway. You can get servers without paying money, right? You can rent them, you can lease them, you can do whatever you want. But, but the conversation was like, why would I ever spend the time setting something up and creating a data center and those assets? And even if it wasn't an OpEx CapEx thing, it became a why would I spend my time ever doing that? I can rent that. Just so, focus on the focus on the me, product. Yeah. Let me give you Go some ahead. practical on what I've learned the with restarting the CTO advisor. Primarily, we're a, a marketing company, uh, right. and that is a direct result of CTO advisor 1.0. And CTO advisor 1.0, the idea was that I could do both advisory work, sixty percent of the time and content strategy the other 40, 30 to 40% of the time to fill the gap. What I discovered was that the, the speed at which I could sell content far outpaced the speed at which I could sell advisory work. Like it was not even a, it wasn't even a comparison in the, and what the market hmm. wanted versus what I wanted to offer. So this comes back to what you're talking about. I had a fundamental question in 1.0. When I realized that, you would think, oh, wow, just pivot and life is good and I'll continue on. Well, I designed my platform to be an advisory company first. Yeah. So I could not pivot because I did not have the platform to be a marketing company, which needed distribution, blah, 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 blah. So I came to the question that you had, which was build versus buy or build on someone else's platform. Other successful media companies have built media platforms in which creators can come and add value on top of that. You lose control, so a lot of parallels to uh, enterprise IT infrastructure. If you build the underlying platform, people can come and, and create marketplaces, they can do, uh, they can create new products and services, but you control the platform and you offer it. So I think the question fundamentally comes by, what product are you building? Are you building a platform which I think requires infrastructure investment, or are you building a product or service that leverages a platform? If you're building a platform or if you're building a product or service that leverages a platform, then there's not a lot of value in, in buying the bits because someone else can do that better. But if you are the mm -hmm. person, if you're the Facebook, if you're the Google, literally in both senses of the word, you know, YouTube, 
has an advantage of building the infrastructure and they have that product and service that you can build on top of me, a curator, and then Facebook, the same thing. So there's value in them building that infrastructure is value in me just consuming it and building a product or service on top. So, so is the, so I think we're going to the, the same question we keep talking about is cloud in many failed models or successful models have started or began or whatever you want to say where they consume those resources because somebody else is managing them. AWS is managing, providing that service, Amazon or uh, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, versus do we invest in the engineering time? So for Keith Townsend's perspective, could he come to me or us or any one of us and say, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to consume AWSs because I need to think about on-prem solutions just for sake of comparison. I need to think about on-prem uh, uh, processes and applications and delivery and all the, those things that go along with that. But I also, and this is a real world conversation I just had in the last 30 minutes. How do we take our on-prem solution and make it SaaS based, but have the same code base? <laughs> Let's talk about this <laughs> because the, the, the assumption is we'll just invest those engineering time into consuming the resources from AWS and not think about what it means on-prem. You can't do that. that. That's just my opinion. You have to think you're either all in and how you invest in your engineering and how you build your services for that delivery, or does that make I, sense? I, I see Rob. It, I it does. No, I, I, here's, here's you're, you're, you're asking, I mean, I love these because we're, we're, you're, I've been struggling with how to ask this question. Yeah. The, the question to me is, does, does that, decision, especially as we get more and more used to it, change the way we think about how we build stuff. I think it like, does. Like I, I and that, that this is my, my big aha in this is that we've got, we're getting to a point or we're already there where when you look at how we're going to build, build things, it, it no longer is the mindset from 20 years ago. It's, it's a, we're, we're thinking of it differently. Like you wouldn't build yeah. Facebook today Facebook wouldn't buy servers today, mm -mm. right? They would, they would do what Netflix does. Although interestingly enough, Netflix reached a scale where they're coming back, but Facebook wouldn't have started with their own infrastructure. They, right. And Rob, um, I think you're exactly where I'm at. And then I'll be quiet because I know others want to talk is, is I know I keep talking about this, but it's going back to the point. Let's try to validate it because, you know, you know, looking around the, I'll say the room, <laughs> some of us have been doing this a while. Um, and, and I see both sides of it. And for me as an engineer, do I need to start investing my time somewhere else? I can do both. But again, it goes back to the conversation we had on Tuesday. I can easily become an AWS architect. It's not the same. In my opinion, that's just my opinion. It's not the same as an architect that we have that we've done for the last 20 years to get us to where we're at from an architecture, building things and all that. Now we're an architect by taking bits and pieces of puzzles that are in AWS services. We're not having to build those. We're just saying that's how that connects to that. And that's how it works. That's that simple. Yeah, I think, well, uh, Larry, you're hitting on the key part where I'm struggling with and I, when people I talk to are struggling with. What capability do I, there's a capability that I want. I want AWS on premises. Like there's no... There's no question about it. If I could get AWS capability, if I could get that abstraction in my data center, I want it. But I also want to own it without having the overhead of needing to manage it. And that simply doesn't exist. What we So what we try to do is we build things like Kubernetes, which is a fine effort because it gives it gives us the the abstractions that we want i just researched csi for the first time uh last week and i'm like this is wonderful like i would love to to take advantage of C, uh, uh csi in my data center but i gotta have kubernetes to do it so the problem is that you have that we have this foot in both worlds where we want the conveniences of public cloud in our, but we want it in our data center. And a solution for that just simply doesn't exist. We want SaaS, we want IaaS, 
we don't want to manage it, but we want to spend the engineering time consuming that on premises. And that's a good point. And then again, I keep saying I'll be quiet, but <laughs> um, Larry, I don't that, believe you. I know nobody believes me. <laughs> <laughs> Says the Canadian. <laughs> Sorry. No, I love it. <laughs> um, you know, the, um, you know, it, it really is because, you know, even us as, as a company, what, you know, me, I struggle day in and day out is do we pivot? Keith Townsend, you brought up a good point. Cause I think, you know, we've had some of these conversations either from afar or, you know, personal is where, where is the value? You know what I mean? You know, from a value perspective, like I said, we can help deliver those things consistently in a format that is consumable on-prem and in the cloud and let us own that, um, th those operational and engineering and all that. Let us own that so you can get the outcome that you're looking for. But that's not necessarily the route that everybody may want to go, right? The, the reality is, You've got all these people that are saying, hey, I'm just going to, you know, I started looking, I joked on Tuesday that I'm going ahead myself and I'm going to, I'm going to go as far as I can down to AWS certs. I don't do certs. So this says a lot, at least for me, but I'm going to do it because I'm trying to prove a point to myself. And to your point, Rob, is I want to get the aha moment where I'm going, oh yes, this is because of my stupidity on my part that I'm not seeing the, the realistic view from an application delivery perspective going forward, how we sustain things. I don't think it's gonna happen, but I'm, I'm open-minded enough to hope. Right, so. yeah, and, and I'm responding to you, but also Keith's question. Um, my, 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 my thought here, as I, I think about you know five or 10 years out, is that we're getting so used to this consumption model that, that we won't that the that the difficulty of not just of doing it but of finding people or finding investment to do it outside of that model um, is potentially like a, a big a big shift in how the whole market is structured, right? I mean the whole thing is like well I can't I can't do anything in this environment unless there's a Kubernetes I can use. I'm just I'm just going to go home, right? I mean uh, Mark I'm trying to find you on the screen. Um, you know, we're talking about Kubernetes and the edge and how it's you know not a particularly good fit. Um, but yet, if what we're saying is true and I can't I, I can't, you know, take a step out of day one without without that as a service and because I'm not used to building anything, it's got to be there. Then it becomes a requirement because of the innovation culture. I keep saying innovation, Rich, and I know that's a, a limiting word, but, you know, uh, because that the culture is, is basically narrowed me down into this subscription path. The idea of building up an infrastructure or to, you know is is becoming um, that, that this is the trend, right? The acceleration I see going forward is it doesn't matter if Amazon's delivering the right services or not or locked in. At some point, it's like, well, that's how we build stuff. I, I don't know any other way. I don't I don't want to do any other way. So. I'm just well, gonna... I mean, so yeah, I, I think that's that's easy for uh, people that don't have the skills, and I, I think your argument is well well taken that the skills will become uh, as cycles go uh, less available. Um, but then, obviously, that that drives up the need for uh, as there's some outages, like there's always going to be. And somebody like an Amazon says, hey, you know, unless you take advantage of our advanced platform services, when we have an outage, you're fucked. <laughs> that's the way things are, you know. Um, and more customers are like, well, you know, I don't like that. I want alternatives. Um, and then they're going to start looking for the skills. And more people are going to switch over and become relevant engineers that can uh, support multiple providers. Um, and I, I think there's always going to be fundamentally some businesses to your uh, Keith and Larry's early, earlier examples that are going to, because the type of products they're selling, they have to have their own infrastructure. They have to have their own data centers because their customers demand it. 
um, and that's fundamentally part of the product they're selling. Um, for instance, if you're a, um, a secure host um, hosting provider and you you're saying that you have the best security ever, um, not a lot of people are going to really accept that you you know you're using other hosting providers if that becomes a service that you know people are willing to pay a premium for, which I think probably maybe even the, even in the near future people will. Some businesses want that extra security. Um, the argument of I've spread your stuff over multiple hosting uh, or uh, at another host is just um, is not going to fly for those types of customers. I, I think also something that I, I think we're kind of missing. Uh, we're, I think we're at the downside of, a, of another um, innovation um, uh, wave. Um, we have it. And I, I think the crest will be of that wave will be um, engineers and this, the skills um, necessary to build your own internal cloud managed service to kind of coin or reuse that phrase um, where you can utilize multiple providers infrastructure as well as your own, as well as your laptop and deploy it um, services on demand and be able to burn that shit to the ground if you know some jackass um, provider like solar winds gets into your infrastructure you didn't realize it and you can burn it out in a matter of minutes because it's all container shit so who cares i build it all the time i'll shut down for an hour figure out some new um, security scans and scan my shit before i deploy and i do it again um, like but you know there's obviously very few companies that do that today but the demand for it solar winds hack being an example is certainly there. People just don't, to a certain extent, know how to do it because it's very complicated. But obviously, CI infrastructure CI/CD, it, it's been around for years. Just not a lot of people do it because it's expensive and you know it's not using virtual machines and <laughs> it's doing a lot of stuff that's you know expensive engineering time and engineering skills. So people don't do it. But I think we're at the beginning of. I think Solar Winds probably one of the events. Their hack is. We're at the bottom of a new wave where different companies um, as consumers of engineering are going to demand a certain amount of um, capability that right now isn't out there, um, at least not widespread in the marketplace. You got to build your own. Um, there's still not a lot of companies that are willing to build OpenStack because it's expensive, you know, uh, labor wise and time wise and maintenance wise. But, you know, is it necessary? I think so. Um, I wouldn't want to lar run a large company that was only on one provider, even if it was just me. I think that's nuts. There's just too many uh, better options out there. But um, if you're, if the marketplace is allowing you to, uh, using your word, Rob, lulling you into kind of a sleep of saying, oh, you're good. You're with AWS. We'll keep you nice and happy. And then suddenly you realize not so much. You know, I, yeah, well, I guess, I guess my, my point here is that it's it's we're beyond lulled. I think we've we've changed the way we approach the problems, right? It's Mark. Go ahead. I, I don't. No, I I don't need to cut in. I'm you know I'm just happy to jump in when I get a chance. Um, I I don't know. Uh, you know I don't I don't. I mean we've had so many of these conversations, and I don't uh, pretend to know um, whether I can say with any kind of certainty that um, Amazon and and Ali Cloud won't end up owning um, the market. I see a lot of reasons why that shouldn't happen. Uh, I see a lot of things that could occur to not make it happen. But I think we we neglect um, a couple of things. I think we neglect history, and I think we neglect opportunity cost um, when we look at existing trends. So let's let's take a uh, opportunity cost approach and just say, what is the cost of um, the opportunity? And, or what's the cost of the opportunity? What's the value of the opportunity for companies approaching the edge, right? And what will they be willing to do? What will their partners be willing to do to enable access or enable that new platform in ways that we aren't considering today in order to bring that value to more people more quickly? So um, an example would be that, uh, you know, I, and I talked about that a little bit in my most recent blog, but an example might be if Google had looked and said in 2000 that the only way I can own the global search and marketing market is by having 
hundred billion dollars worth of data center and infrastructure assets and the people to manage them based on my understanding of those needs today, today meaning in 2000, they never would have built it. They never would have built it. And they solved for problems from an infrastructure delivery standpoint and from an efficiency of management of that infrastructure standpoint that effectively enabled them to exist at scale and still to be able to offer us search for free, right? I mean, it's, it's that I see edge the same way. Another way to look at this from a people standpoint is we think, all of us believe, I'm not arguing with Larry, I'm not arguing with Keith, all of us believe that it's a struggle to maintain the appropriate resources to attempt to replicate something like AWS and manage it internally. But let's go back in history. It's 1979, 1981, and most of us have MIS departments that are running a mainframe. Mm -hmm. How many of those people knew how to build an inter-office network and, and build PCs and build um, uh, you know, small server delivery of applications? How many of them knew coding in individual departments? None of them. It's so much easier to build those skills and the volume of opportunity dictates that no matter how hard the problem appears, solving for that problem is has the value necessary. Actually, your your case in some ways is compelling around the the, the thing that we're trying to talk about, which is what happens in the future. There's there are parallels to what these service providers have built from a mainframe perspective, where we've made this assumption that we have to have a huge footprint of infrastructure, right, a mainframe in order to accomplish anything and that we're going to sell timeshares for it. Um, and, you know, PCs ended up with, yeah, I don't want to be in your, in that control model. I want to, you know, it's, you know I can make a small investment and, and be successful here. Um, and it was a pretty radical shift. Um, and it was a control shift. This, this to me, I mean, so that there, the CapEx OpEx conversation last week started from a, will consumers, what, it, what causes consumers to regain control conversation, right? That was sort of Tim, Tim's point with, with this, where we, we started was at some point, the buyers will have authority or take authority because they're getting too restricted or it's too expensive. Um, and then, and then we, we went back into, well, it's CapEx OpEx. We're never going to buy things again. We're just going to keep keep the services model is so entrenched in what we do. We're, we're, we're addicted to that. We're not going to, we're not going to go back. Um, and so there's a weird transact. There's a, there's a transition from that perspective that I'm trying to get a, a feel for. So Rob, I, yeah. I think where me and Mark converge is this long arc is where, you know, we focus the conversation on 2030. Mm -hmm. Kubernetes, the concept will win like that because that's what the market wants. And we're in a market that uh, will build what the market wants. Will it be Kubernetes? I don't know. Will it be open? Will OpenStack come back and and, and, <laughs> and, and it be boy. that thing? I didn't laugh, don't, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. I, that part, I that don't know. Pop, right? <laughs> I'm but not a real I, believer in zombies. Yeah, there you go. Sorry. But that, Remember that I took the bait. That concept will win eventually. I think I, I, in the short, we have this debate on whether or not AWS, Ali, uh, Google becomes the, the manifestation of that vision. This whole portable, you know, I wrote 10 years ago that you'll be able to V motion your entire data center from one provider to another one, you know, 15 years later, 15 years from now, maybe we'll be able to do it. But that, the, I think that concept will will win. We'll have the skill, and vendors will figure it out. I just don't think we're close in the next couple of years of getting getting to that place. Let me play devil's advocate then. So, why has serverless? Um, why has mm. more organizations not uh, adopted serverless? Because it's in the wrong context. Advocate. It's in the wrong context. Serverless, serverless in the in the in public cloud is 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 really the wrong place for it to exist. Serverless. Okay is gonna win at the edge. And it's gonna win at the edge because, excuse my language, but Kubernetes is a clusterfuck at the edge. <laughs> uh, and to just 
Furthermore, uh, serverless is um, for new business cases, for specific types of use cases. Um, and uh, just as an example, for machine learning, what I'm seeing is that for data engineers, it's like half of data engineers that use AWS use Lambda. So, I mean, it's dramatic how significant the uptake you, of serverless is for certain types of use cases, specifically hey, like batch hey, type hey, use cases. Hey, Lawrence, when you, just, when you say use Lambda, I'm, I'm assuming that this is a have some Lambda use as opposed to our Lambda, right? It's not a volume statement. It's a, it's a checkbox statement, which is not bad. I just want clarification. It's a checkbox statement. I, you know, we could go into a whole nother conversation, but I, I've looked at it in a thousand different angles. So that's yeah. another conversation. No, I, I, I yeah. this is my, my point here is that, and th but it's significantly important. The ubiquity of Lambda for anybody consuming AWS is a true statement. If you were using, it's just like, it's just like everybody on the planet, every company is using AWS. That mm -hmm. is a true statement, right? They might not even realize mm -hmm. it, but they're using AWS, 100%. The, 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 but it could just be that they're using a tiny amount. So they, they check box, yes, I'm using AWS. And I think Lambda's. I think Lambda's that way. You have some companies that are very in on Lambda and 100%, you know, 99% Lambda, and you have companies that are that are using it to connect two systems together. It actually doesn't make them any less dependent on Lambda. Uh, and but, I'm with you. So uh, I believe Cloud Health just came out with a study last week saying that uh, Lambda budgets have gone up. Spend. Median spend on Lambda for people who use companies that use Lambda went up fifteen percent in the last six six months. Among I would, their customers, I would I would buy that. So so here's this is the ironical thing about Lambda and serverless. So the concept of serverless invented by a cloud provider for a completely different reason is what is actually going to be its death knell at the edge. So the 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 server serverless at the edge wins because of its compatibility with distributed applications. The idea of, of functions nested upon functions across code and data on a distributed network of computers, it fucking wins, guys. I'm telling you, it wins hands down. M Kubernetes in the, in the monolithic way that we do DevOps today does not work in a world where code and data needs to be highly mobile, where it needs to exist everywhere and anywhere in a moment in time. Serverless is what solves that. Now, that's not what Amazon had in mind, by the way. I mean, Lambda... Lambda as a, as a feature, as a tool set, was really intended simply for Amazon to extract greater profitability out of a single machine. So I, I'm I, curious, I, when you say that, what control plane runs at the edge to support serverless? Yeah. And because it, so, it is an it is it, open stack. You, it's not actually, a just, John, in addition yeah. to the control. Thank you, John. In, a, in, a, uh, in addition to the question John uh, Sharber just asked to John Cowan, could you dive a little more deeply into why you think serverless, you know, kind of naturally is a is a solution for the kind of distributed so deployment of applications and and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It needs so yes so it's serverless by itself. The concept of lambda isn't isn't a copy paste to the edge. Okay, it's a it's an it's a component of what the successful edge is going to look like. Yes, there needs to be a control plane. Yes, there needs to be uh, there needs to be uh, accompanying technology that allows um, a certain function to be where it needs to be at any one point in time. There needs to be that back end um, system, if you will, that ultimately you know manages a a network of uh, serverless functions. So uh, putting that aside, and I'm, I'm only, I'm just describing that the basis of decomposing applications into discrete functions and simply focusing on that, right? And and breaking apart this idea of a monolithic appla application being deployed to a specific endpoint, right? That concept of what serverless is, is what's going to drive adoption of it and acceleration of the concept of serverless as we move Deeper and deeper and deeper into cloud services at the edge. That's what that's that's what I'm positing here today. And the service mesh, there's various 
different open source and products that support serverless networks. Mm -hmm. um, they're usually called service meshes. Mm -hmm. um, they work. I've actually tested them on my laptop and deployed them to public providers. Um, but it requires somewhat of a, um, a hybrid skill set, much like nice. when you asked network engineers that had always touched hardware that had Cisco uh, degrees or cert certificates, but they're more like degrees. Um, and we're always kept up to date and we're married to that platform. And then suddenly introducing him to something like, uh, well, all the various different SDN ideas, open source uh, communities yeah. and everything else. And it was just a huge culture clash. They had no, um, I actually had people quit from various companies when we tried to introduce SDN. Um, just the concept, much less actually applying yeah. it. That just people don't think that way. They're in that. Yeah, they don't business. think that way. Yeah, I, I agree. So this but, is but the same thing. Like it's a it's a completely fundamental shift of, um, well, it's a it is. it's forcing a programmer to understand network engineering in a fundamentally low level way, and forcing them to decompose their uh, their product development in a fundamentally different way. Yes, today. So, today but but yeah. okay so this is you know this is a this is a continuum yeah. right we don't we don't work our industry doesn't work in like phase gate stair step kind of ways it's an evolution it's a curve and so what's going to what what i believe will happen is the innovation and the, and the money that will pour into disruption will be focused on trying to make that easy to try and abstract that complexity away so that you can get all the benefit of decomposing applications into discrete functions without having to think about all of the things that you need to think about much the same way quite frankly the aws did for virtualization i mean i didn't you know you don't need to know anything about zen to be able to use aws when it when when it developed a service uh, yeah. for infrastructure the I same will it. happen as as more innovators and thinkers pour into actually cracking the nut for how do i scale applications planet wide um, and make them make my code and data available everywhere and anywhere it needs to be at a moment in time. But I, can I just you, make you, a, a simple point? Um, so I have multiple customers that run into this over the years and uh, one just as recently as just, um, yeah, actually I'm working with them right now, that um, because of the way that they, they operate and run, my example of Cisco trained engineers, um, they fundamentally still operate and run that way, whether it's a government institution or um, an organization that's been around for 10, 20 years, they, mm -hmm. they fundamentally think and operate the same way. They build skills, um, they build out specific departments around those skills and what they manage. And typically still what they're fundamentally based on is, um, is a, a unit of compute. Um, and they're still building servers, uh, physical servers. They just happen to be mm -hmm. virtualized. Um, and they still think that way. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys have remember the, uh, there's a, a really good um, uh, discussion about why the space shuttle is the width that it is. And it goes all the way back through history of different um, examples of um, why the space shuttle um, was, uh, the different components of it were shaped the way it were, it was. And it's because of the width of, the, of a horse's ass. And it's because of the size of the roads and shit had to be shipped to all the way through tunnels and everything else. And so it went back to like, it gave a really cool example of um, the space shuttle was actually designed partially by the Romans. Um, it's kind of a, a stretch, but it's, it's mm -hmm. the example of people. It's really hard to break the way people think yeah. because of all of these dependencies and, and fundamentally still it's people. Um, they think like I thought, it was, I thought it was because of the configuration of first class seating, but I, I was <laughs> that's the dragon module for for that one. <laughs> the uh, but I mean, but and but we treat that we treat these as a negative thing. It is not a bad. It's not. It, there's nothing wrong with that, right? The the fact is that the 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 funk the form is following an evolved form that is proven durable over you know mm -hmm. millennia. Um, yeah. But I, I think, you know, what, what John is saying about the serverless stuff, I think, is actually the point we started with on steroids. Because what we're, what we're if, if we're saying that I can now innovate because I'm just doing these, this little unit, and there's a whole bunch of services packed, right? The, the challenge with serverless, which definitely fuels innovation and is great and fast, it relies on services being packed around that, right? The That's Kubernetes... Right. 
um, love hate relationship we're showing, you know, is is a consistent way to deliver services. So we have functions, we have services, we have infrastructure packed around that. We're moving to a place though where if we're getting we're doing micro transactions on serverless, right? That's built on services. That's right. We're we're in the subscription economy. At the end of the day, very few people are, are even going to worry about what it takes to build that infrastructure yeah, around they, it. And they, I think they, we've we've changed they, how we're approaching there's things. There's some yeah, really pragmatic stuff that's being missed here. And and um, I, I like serverless, by the way. <laughs> I'm not anti-serverless, but serverless is expensive, sure. right? It, 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 to fire up a serverless function, if you're using something like Knative, you got to fire up a pod in an instance, right? We, we have, when we're talking with the Swim.io guys, talk about how fast it is doing everything in memory and not hitting storage. Serverless is incredibly expensive, right? Very few applications have been written in a serverless fashion. Little functions, things I do based on events, there, lots of that stuff happens. But there's not applications that are written purely around a serverless space. No one's decomposed their applications that way. Not right? entirely, that's right. They can't. Yeah. So the, I, I, I would agree with that, John. Some control point. Right. Yeah, I would, I, would agree, I would totally agree with that, John. I, and this is, and again, you know, as technology evolves and innovation is, is, in, is uh, accelerated and what have you, I think these are all challenges and, and whatnot that the, that the market will attempt to solve for. Um, even things like cold starts is a big issue, right? In serverless as well. Like that's a, it's a it's a a bit of a dog to try and crack that nut too. Um, but um, but this is this is you know again we're talking like mid flight and we're looking at you know cloud twenty thirty. It's early. Like we have a, almost a decade of evolution to take place. And I'm I'm trying to describe the evolution from a a, a macro perspective, like where this is going to go. And, okay. and and I'm saying this from the context that if if I'm building the kinds of internet applications and the internet economy that exists is, exists in 2030, it is not going to be how we make money on the internet today. It is going to fundamentally change, right? This is I'm, I, I happen to be a very large proponent of the internet of things economy. And I hate, I don't like the internet of things uh, uh, moniker or, or, or name, but it is accurate in describing that the future of the internet economy is machines talking to machines, generating utilization and driving money. It's not humans anymore. John, a decade this is really interesting interesting conversation. Conversation. Is it their CapEx budget or their OpEx budget to pay you? Well, CapEx, CapEx or OpEx. So here's this is what I would this is what I would say. If I if I if I can fast forward in time, I would prefer that I'm occupying a computer for only a microsecond and then I'm gone and I don't have to provision shit and occupy resources and pay for them. That's my ideal environment if I'm building an application that, for instance, is simply applying an algorithm to a, a two-second video feed in an urban environment, as an example. I don't want to have, I can't spin up the kind of resources that I do in the cloud today and pay for them. John, what you're thinking of is essentially um, uh, a, a marketplace where um, a lot of the things we're talking about, um, even getting down to um, managing threads, is, is all commoditized. Yeah, um, which I think is totally doable, possible. I mean, we're we're getting relatively close with serverless, um, but this this stuff has only been around for like three years, um, maybe four, um, if you really think about it. Really, the the concepts were around. Um, mm -hmm. We've been talking about them for a decade. Of you know, why, why can't we just manage threads across your data centers? Um, and Google operationalized it, but um, the the commoditization of serverless has not happened yet. It's still um, to yeah, other it's examples. It's, it's, it's expensive. Early. So, so uh, but like when mobile. we get to that point, it's managing threads across multiple providers, whether that's mm -hmm. thousands in, in the future sense uh, for doing internet of things, everything's at the edge or most, a lot of stuff's at the edge. Um, but there's, there's still gonna have to be um, those skills to manage those meshes of threads are still going to be critical. Um, and the latency involved is going to be critical. Right. Um, there's going to be an assumption of almost no latency. So managing that is going to be, it may be commoditized at a certain level, certainly for the developer. Um, they might not understand a lot of what's behind it. We may go back to where, you know, the developer not un knowing what a network is, is, is uh, commonplace again. Um, but 
now that commoditization network of all that stuff is going to be even more critical, even more expensive, even more valuable to run and manage. There may be less people doing it, but much like um, somebody who has a nuclear engineering degree that can run a nuclear engineering, excuse me, a nuclear power plant, right now it's not extremely valuable because there's just not a lot of them. But if you have that skill, you're going to be crazy valuable because it's really For important. Sure. So, um, sure. There just may not be a lot, of, you know, there may be only two or three of us on this call in 30 years. And that's, that's possible, to, you know, that, so like, I, you know, we, we've been through this before, right? Like we've seen, we've seen the multiplier effect on the internet economy when a technology or a service comes along that makes it easier to do stuff that was previously complicated. You know, web services led by AWS and a handful of others is a, is a movement that made it possible for a greater number of people, a wider audience to build really cool applications and serve them up to customers. I mean, so, if you think about, if you think about how difficult it was to do that, like in the dot-com era versus post 2005, like, like the, it just, the, this is what I describe as the abstraction away of complexity. Technology moves along a curve as it matures. What it's doing as it grows in adoption it, um, is primarily removing uh, complexity. It's taking away the difficulties that exist. I don't need to be a nuclear science to build facebook.com or whatever the app is. I, I, I don't need to invest millions of dollars in hardware and have my own data center to build pets.com anymore. Right? Th this is what I'm talking about. And I think that, I, go ahead. Yes, yeah, but, but the, the problem to me is, is that there's an assumption based in here that doing those operations keeps getting harder instead of getting, right? So the, the, this, is, this is the thing that I, I get frustrated about when I think about, the trend line here is that we're making this assumption that running a data center is equivalent to running a nuclear power or a nuclear submarine. And instead mm, of no, assuming I wasn't, that- I wasn't trying that, to make that comparison. Okay, well, but, but I see this happen, right? Instead of it being that the data center, like, like this is what the normal trend line is. If data centers are really valuable to businesses, you would think they would become plug and play and easier to operate and drop ship infrastructure. and we're not seeing that trend line. What oh, we're we seeing drop, is we're seeing we drop ship infrastructure. What do you, we, we ship racks, right? I mean, we literally drop ship infrastructure. I, I don't know anyone that goes and rack. Well, there's the people that still rack stuff, but I mean, when we build data centers, don't you drop ship a rack? Yep. You, That's exactly you, how we did it. There's no we, other way to do it. In fact, in a lot of cases, wait, wait, we yeah, drop but, ship but, rows. But, but hold, but hold on. I was on a call the other day that, um, where they were talking about like VX rail. So when people do that, they're buying incredibly expensive pre-wired infrastructure that doesn't compete with Amazon. No. So the, the and that, but, that's, but that's, let me, let me, that's, that's not, a, that's not a, the, the market let forces me, shouldn't be driving that way. It should let be me driving try bring this. towards, go ahead. Yeah, let me, I, I think I think there's like, I walked in the middle of a story, but that's yeah, right. so, so the future, what I'm hearing is the future is microservices of the edge. So let me push back on that. Right. If I'm doing a data aggregation or data distillation, why would that be functionless? If I'm listening to a constant stream of data from an autonomous vehicle, why, why wouldn't I instantiate an instance instead of trying to react to every event? My, my point being, this is use case specific. So I think I think you're right that it's use case specific, and I think I think when you're when we're having this conversation, it's important to declare what what version of the internet you think we're talking about or you're talking about right so um you know and again i you know I, when i when i in this context i you know i'm i'm i am putting forward that i believe that the future of the internet economy is is in connected things and autonomous things um that's so i i i have that context in my mind right and I'm, and in that context i'm thinking how am i going to provision my entire stack to a million endpoints in order to serve that autonomous vehicle that's moving from city to city or region to region. How am I going to do that? Using Kubernetes? Fuck no, I'm not doing that. It's not going to happen. It wasn't built for that. But I love it, it, by the way. I'm a huge Kubernetes fan. I'm just going to put but, that but out there. Back, back up a layer then, right? So yes, you're not going to provision. Well, so first off, <clears throat> If you're really going to go to the edge in a global fashion, you're not going to configure to a vendor, right? There's to no vendor? 
Amen. AWS that's not, that's not get, doable. Yeah. AWS is not going to get you everywhere you need to go. Mm -hmm. Right. So what do you? So if you're talking 2030, what are you going to configure to? I okay. So I'll say something here that I'll say something here that again I, and again we you know we are you're, we're forward thinking here. Okay. So you know the the cone of certainty and uh, whether or not we're right or wrong is pretty wide here. But what I'll say is that I think that protocols are going to matter more than products okay and vendors so much the same way that the that the internet is about protocols and not platforms or products um, I think that that the evolution of protocols are going to help with that but it, it, let me let me add in something that I, I think we're not thinking about products or in a product sense um, or solution sense I guess I don't you know yeah we're thinking as engineers not as product yeah, yeah. product mm -hmm. managers oh, I get it. Think yeah, like I get a it. product guy um, we're, we're essentially, if I was to kind of encapsulate the typical customer that I think we're talking about, it's more of a, a SaaS, um, you know, a, a word, well, not maybe a WordPress, but more of a SaaS type customer who has a certain type of expectation of, you know, I'm going to come up with very, um, uh, zero coding types, um, problems. Um, and excuse me, uh, uh, very simple uh, engine or uh, application type problems, and, and I expect zero coding type solutions. And so, um, and I, I think in like SaaS terms, where I, I get software and I don't have to know so much of what's behind it, I, I kind right. of like move, like more like a low, around. a low code style, a low code style of doing low code. Something. Yes, thank you. So, yeah, but I, um, that that's just one persona, and there's there's certainly there's a marketplace for that, but those people generally don't pay very much for services because they don't understand the value of them. So really their expectation of, um, of uh, complexity and other things is extremely low. And so th they're going to be the, the $10 a month type of customer that's like an iTunes, like I, I have uh, for my, my uh, iTunes uh, iCloud backup. You know, it's, it's 15 bucks a month. Um, it gives me a, a terrible... A terabyte of storage, but my expectations are, are practically nothing um, because I don't expect it to be highly available. I expect it to get it eventually if I pull stuff back. And I certainly can't get all the terabyte back, but, right. um, but, but for the other personas, other customers, there's lots of different kinds, like, um, like a company that's competing with, I, um, with a, a YouTube, like Rumble. Um, their expectations as a customer are going to be incredibly high. And, in, and to a certain extent, they have to have their own data centers because mm -hmm. um, at least one of their possible uh, providers of service is their competitor, Google. So uh, at least a major one that has global reach. So they're going to have to have some of their own data center mixed in with some other providers. They're going to have to understand how containers and, and the difference between block and object storage and uh, yeah. how caching works. I mean, th there's no way they're going to get away with that. So there's... There's going to be lots of, and obviously that customer is going to be willing to pay 10,000 X to what a, a SaaS customer is going to be willing to pay. There's going to be more of those. So right? I have a question around like pace of this transition, because I'm looking and we're thinking like engineers are like, okay, the technology itself there, we can, uh, and maturing, we can do it. And I just keep harking back how I was in a data center a few weeks ago and I'm looking at a bunch of deck bo boxes, DEC deck boxes yeah. and how I interviewed the folks at Capital One and they said it took them seven years to move out of their data centers. The scale of where the industry is at and we're talking about 2030, if it took Capital One seven years has the industry created the factory mode to, to make this transition happen where we're talking about serverless at the edge being mainstream in nine years when there's still very much Solaris running a good portion of mission critical applications? I'm challenging the concept that you know the, the on paper, yeah, this stuff can happen if I'm a if I'm a startup and I can do all of this, but the industry at mass? Yeah, Keith, in a word, no, absolutely not, and not in ten years either. 
the virtual machines will still be around in, or uh, maybe VPS and that kind of uh, concept, but essentially the concept of the width of the horse's ass still being uh, virtual yeah. machines will still be around totally, in 10 years. Totally I don't doubt it. Well, but I think you got to remember that, that half of the existing companies on the S&P 500 won't be on the S&P 500 in 10 years. That, their rate and their ability to move sure. and innovate means they'll likely be displaced. So no, I think there's, I think yeah. there's some connection between the underlying technology that gets used and the success of the company, but there are also incredibly important and successful companies that are still running on mainframes, and there is no impetus or positive business value to make that move. So does that mean that they're, they're making a poor choice? I, I don't buy into that because I've gone through that path with a number of companies and it doesn't play out. I mean, it sounds good theoretically, but in reality, it just doesn't, it doesn't play out. Now, does that mean that, that just sitting, you know, the, the converse is true, just sitting on that legacy infrastructure is, is going to get you where you need to go? No, it's not. The reality is it's something in the middle and the world is getting more complicated and we have to acknowledge that. But I think, you know, this conversation is somewhat, I'll just be candid, somewhat interesting and somewhat uninteresting. And the reason I say that is that I feel like, you know, there's a lot of theoretical that's coming into this uh, conversation, but the one thing that is not being asked, and Keith is kind of, in some ways, kind of dancing around it, but, you know, to be more direct, we're not asking, nobody's asking the question, why? Why is the case? Sean, I think you, had, you asked the question yeah. way back at the beginning of this of, you know, why are these companies not adopting serverless or CI/CD pipelines? There's good reason for that. Mm -hmm. But until you understand what's holding that up, it's all theory. But Tim, well, but Tim to, to your my point, own. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, Tim, Tim to your point, which I agree with. Why the, the, you're asking why haven't I? And I would say why would they? I I I I said this in a post earlier. I think we're asking, I think when we look at CapEx and OpEx, those are just, those are ways that we are paying for things in a way in which from an accounting perspective, we get the best tax benefit for that, right? So from a CapEx to OpEx, that's tax driven, bookkeeping driven, right? It's not it's nothing about technology, it's nothing about innovation. That when CapEx was king, we spent a lot of money on servers because it was cheap, it was inexpensive and the finance department could care less. So technology's got their wish. But the question is, to me, when we look at 2030, it's not what technology is gonna be driving, it's what needs of the business are gonna drive the technological innovation to be able to solve it first in the clunky way, right? Old you know, data centers or whatever. And as we progress through that, technologists are gonna to innovate to do it faster, cheaper, and better but it's still about solving the business problem. And so I asked to your question, Tim, what is the use case for the change that we are appearing to look that, that's gonna happen in 2030 that, you know, you know, you asked for serverless. I thought serverless was gonna be bigger than it is, but the reality is it was driven by who? Developers, why? Because they don't wanna to have to deal with technologists, they wanna move faster. It was, the business came to the developers and said, how can we move faster to keep up with our customers' desires and wants and needs. And they said, well, if I didn't have to worry about infrastructure and I could just deploy my stuff and let the infrastructure figure it out, then we don't have to take time building that infrastructure. But behind serverless, there's still infrastructure. There's still an endpoint that has to be built. Yeah, I completely sure. agree, Keith. I, I mean, the why question is more of a generic question, not taking aside one direction or the other. But to your point about serverless, I mean, is it is it that serverless was adopted because it was a stopgap and it was a it was a convenient and clever solution, or is it because it truly is an amazing platform to be able to or architecture to build upon, and we could see that playing out into the future? And I think the answer will take you in different places, but I would subscribe more to the former than the latter because the latter suggests that there was. There was a whole lot of uh, correlation that took place, and that generally doesn't happen in this industry. Okay, so so let's just be clear that the the motivation of either making money or saving money is never going to change by 2030, and that's totally fine. That's the context in which we uh, operate as architects and builders of technology solutions 
end of story. So, I so the use case, the use case for serverless is kind of like a, it's kind of like a, a weird question to kind of pose because it, it it's highly dependent. It's highly dependent on what it is you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve. So I don't think you can take like a big, a big question, a broad swath question like that and say, well, what's the use case? Um, it is highly dependent. So here's what I, here's what I will say. What I will say is that the origin of serverless as a concept from Amazon Web Services was born the same way. This was about AWS trying to generate greater return on capitalized assets, servers in a data center. Serverless functions as a service does that. It does that because they're able to monetize, uh, they're able to oversubscribe a, a single server uh, to a far greater degree than they can with virtual machines. It's really that simple. So serverless is a great product if you can drive adoption for it. I'm, having, I'm here saying that I don't think serverless in the context of centralized clouds is really where that technology is going to find its stride. I don't believe that. I don't believe you're going to see wide scale adoption of serverless uh, over other technologies in a centralized data center. All right, I'm, we, need to, we need to wrap. I wanted to give Mark the last word and then tee us up for a, a maybe, maybe Mark, are, can you tee us up for next week's conversation in, your, in, your, your, in a closing thought? Um, I apologize. I don't even remember what next week's conversation is. <laughs> next, uh, we haven't, Bird, we haven't Burger figured King out, or we, McDonald's. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't figured out, we haven't the figured out the war. I've, I've been, I've been skipping stone on this, skipping stone. So that, you know, what we come out of from this week to me is where we go next week. Um, okay. And, well, I, and, I, I don't, I don't know whether this would feed into a conversation in and of itself, but I, um, I think of, um, a couple of things based on what everybody's been saying. And um, I don't know, you know, obviously, I don't know if any of us know uh, whether uh, any single one of us is right or wrong. Um, but I think there's a, a, a point that's critical for us to consider. Uh, and it does go back to what John said most recently about cost. I don't think that's ever a dynamic that's going to, um, that can be ignored um, uh, in the relationship between a delivery of a service and the CFO in any company. I don't think you can ignore it. You can ignore it for a period of time when things look great, but the minute things go down, the CFO will be looking for cost savings opportunities. And if that cost savings opportunity is saying, Larry, I need you to build the email server because it'll be cheaper if you run it, even though it's not your core competency, then that's exactly what Larry will fucking do. So the, the other thing is that we're, I think, we're not, and I don't, I don't know if this is a problem per se, I just think it's an interesting dynamic, is that we're not um, taking into a consideration that technology is not an afterthought portion of a business in 2030. If anything any of us believe in is true about business and digital transformation, then the average business in 2030 will be 30 or 40% technology driven from a finance standpoint. What does that do? Well, certainly it pushes for greater automation and greater speed, but it also means that the line for impact on revenue and value is, is much easier to notice when you're spending 30% of your revenue on the cost of technology. Call it engineering, right. call it the IT department, call it a combination, but PayPal pays 40% of their cost to technology. And if the vast majority of companies go from three to 5% to 10 to 25%, then the dynamic of, of why they buy and how they have to plan for their future is going to change significantly between now and 2030. Make money, save money. Yeah, but the, that, that the division of the technology spend is so broad in terms of the SaaS versus the internal sure. spend, uh, but worth discussing. Hope you enjoyed uh, this Cloud 2030 session. Next week, we're going to pick it back up looking at Edge uh, and, you know, sort of the, the purchase decisions of, of what's going to tip the scales. And I'm still trying to figure out how we get to an inflection point um, where consumers exert influence and demand portable standards and protocols and, and things that are uh, not as locked into one infrastructure for expediency, um, serverless only seems to lock people in. It doesn't create the portability. So I'm still asking that question. Come to the next session. We'll talk to you then. Thanks.